When you have children and they're, they're faced with an unknown object or, or whatever, and there's an adult like myself standing there and staring at them, they don't do anything. Not because of the computer, but because of me. So I kind of turned around and w went away when I realized that they were not doing anything because I was standing there. And as soon as I did that, I heard the voices of children behind me, you know, going and touching the computer. And about four or five hours later, and all this is actually now documented, it's an old story, four or five hours later, a colleague of mine came and said, how did you manage to teach them? So I said, teach them what? And he said, you know, they're, they're surfing and they're teaching each other how to surf. And I, I thought, well, that's impossible because they don't know any English. They've never seen a computer before. They don't know what the internet is. So how did they learn? And we didn't know. Then the press came along. And the press thought that in those days, 1999, the press thought that I was telling lies when I said no one taught them. They just learned this by themselves. And they said, but that can't happen. I mean, this is a high-tech device. Remember 99, OK? So it was a high-tech device. The internet, a very new, very urban thing. So how could it happen? Some people said, well, what about uh, passing students? Maybe somebody showed them. So I repeated the experiment again in a village quite far away, Raibareli district, and uh, saw the same thing happen again. So then I thought, well, uh, this time nobody could have taught them. So they were teaching themselves. But how can they teach themselves? How can a group of children who don't know something um, learn how to do things by themselves? We didn't have an answer. And I used to get, uh, keep getting asked this question over and over again. And I used to keep saying, I don't know how it happens. But it seems to happen all the time, each time. Then the international press started coming. And I have uh, managed to unearth a picture, which is from a German magazine called uh, Stern magazine. Uh, they put this on their cover. And it's funny, that picture, when you look at it, I think you'll find it funny. It was my attempt to find out how the children were learning. Okay, so that's all I could do was stand behind the wall. He's staring at them, so what are they doing? But they weren't doing anything in particular. They were basically just calling each other idiots. And saying, you haven't done that right, you know. Press this, press that, and that's all. So how was this happening? But it was happening everywhere. At that time, I got funded by the World Bank. They said, can you prove that this will happen everywhere and that you are not just seeing some accidental results? So I repeated the experiment, and we did this, I think, about uh, 17 different villages, um, a total of 22, but we took 17 eventually, across the length and breadth of India, from uh, you know, the remotest places that we could find to the urban most places that we could find. And over a period of five years, we studied uh, what would happen. And uh, here, here's a video, it's a, a scratchy old video from a long time ago, but I think it turned out to be one of the most important uh, experiments um, uh, that was to affect education everywhere. So th this is a video from Kalkaji, and uh, within the very first day in 1999. This guy on the right, he was eight years old at that time. His student on the left is six, and he was teaching her how to browse. Then we go to Rajasthan. So what was happening? We still don't know exactly. We don't know how 
the children in a month's time would start downloading games from the internet and installing them onto computers and then playing them. We don't know how in a remote village in Maharashtra a virus attack on a computer uh, would be solved by an eight-year-old by downloading a free virus eliminator and then killing the virus. We don't know how this happens, but we know that it does happen everywhere. Not just in India, then the experiment spread out, and here you see it's still in existence today. This is Uganda, and there's a company that puts the hole-in-the-wall uh, computer, uh, computers there, and they observe also exactly the same thing. So then, when these computers were there, I mean, most of them don't work today because, you know, the experiment is long, long over. But uh, I, the question I used to get asked often was, so what? Okay, so you've shown that these poor children are able to, you know, figure out what the internet is and to do things on the internet. So what? What's going to happen to them? I didn't have an answer to that because I hadn't even thought about that question. I was only trying to see what children can learn and how. But then I started asking the children other things. So I would go to these villages where the children are playing some game or the other, so I would ask them, uh, what's the time? Can your computer tell me the time? And they would say, oh, that's easy. You can go to the computer, type something, and then they'll say, yeah, it's uh, 10.42. So I would say, wow, fantastic. That's very good. So what's the time in New York, in America? And the children would say, 10.42. So I would say, oh, at the same time. And they would say, of course, it's 10.42 here, it's 10.42 in the next village, it's 10.42 in the village after that, it's 10.42 everywhere. So then I would say, you know what? Somebody told me that this might not be true, that very far away places might have a different time. And the children said, oh, how can that be? I said, yeah, why don't you find out from the computer? So you ask them, and then what do you do? Remember, you, you, you shouldn't stick around there because then they won't do anything. Move out, go away. After, give them about 15, 20 minutes. So 15 or 20 minutes later, and this is a real, a real instance, the children would come back and they would say, oh, it's a different time in New York. It's night. So I would say, that's absurd. How can two places have two different times? I mean, it's 10.42 here, it should be 10.42 everywhere. Can you find out why the time is different? And they would take another 10 minutes, and then something strange would happen. One child would come up and say, the earth is round, the sun shines from one side, so it's day on this side, night on the other side, and day and night have different times. So of course, two places have to have different times. And then I thought, my God, this is a lot more than just learning computers. This is learning other things. Who taught them? And again, no answer. Were they just reading straight off the internet? Can't be true because they, don't, they, they can't read that well in English. So where was this learning happening from? I started making the questions harder and harder and harder. I won't go through that whole exercise, but I'll just tell you one of the most recent ones that I did in England, again with nine-year-olds. Um, so I went in there and I, 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 I made up a little story. I said, imagine that you have two pencils and they're very far away from each other, very, very far away. Uh, if I do something to one pencil, if I drop it, will the other pencil fall as well? And they still laughed and said, of course not. They're two different places, how can they? I said, could it be possible that exactly the same things will happen to them at the same time? And they said, no, it's not possible. So I said, and it's important how you say this to children. Then I said, you know what? Somebody told me that it is possible. Under certain circumstances, the two pencils get linked to each other. Would it be true? And the children said, oh, that's absurd. They started working. 25 minutes later, like in my Indian experiment, the children said, my God, it's true. There can be particles which across the universe behave exactly the same way. Whatever you do to this one, the same thing happens to the other one. And I said, I don't believe this. How is it possible? And the nine-year-olds in England said, Sugata, have you not heard of quantum entanglement? 
<laughs> so I said, I can't even spell it. <laughs> so they, they say, and did they understand physics? No, of course not. But in their nine-year-old way, they explained to me the frontiers of human knowledge. Why was this possible? And how does it work? Well, I don't know, but I can write a statement which, you know, I've been a teacher all my life, so it's very difficult for me to write this, but you take a look at this. Children given access to the internet in groups can learn anything by themselves. Okay, it sounds terrible, but I've seen it over and over and over again. From the remotest places in India to the most advanced places in the expensive schools in the world, uh, this statement runs true. The question is, how does it work? Well, I couldn't, I still don't know. But I took this over, I took this method over from India into England in 2006. You know, I, it makes me feel quite happy to say this, standing on this podium. It wasn't something we imported, not from some land somewhere. It was from here that I took it to England and then to the rest of the world. We called it a self-organized learning environment. So what does it mean? Well, it's very simple. If you have a classroom, you can do it immediately. And I hope you will, at least a few of you will, I hope. What you do is the following. Take a classroom. Hopefully you should have furniture which can be rearranged a little. You know, these rows and columns of chairs doesn't work very well for this. If there are 20 children, take five computers with internet connections. One is to four. And just scatter them around the classroom, anywhere. And then you bring in your 20 children, ask them a question. Ask them a nice, big, interesting, difficult question. And then leave them alone. Some teachers ask me, shall we, sh shall we ask them to make groups? And I tell them, if there are five computers and 20 children, what else can they do? except make groups. Except that if you don't tell them to make groups, then the groups they make are their own and not your groups, just like the hole in the wall. And then give them about 20 or 30 minutes and then have them present their answers. You'll get, I can, I can give you a guarantee that you'll get some surprises at the depth to which children will answer such questions. You will also ask yourself, like I asked myself, how did they manage to understand things which are so much beyond their individual capability to understand? Here's what uh, souls, they're called souls, S-O-L-E, self-organized learning environments. Here's what they looked like back in those days. So uh, there's no audio in this, by the way. You know, souls can be very noisy. That's why I've taken the audio out. But as, as you can see, it's children, basically it's very simple, it's children left to themselves with something to look for in the presence of the internet. Not individual internet on little computers, but shared internet on big computers. It actually costs less to do a soul than to give a computer to every child. So, how does it work? Well, I'm going to make a guess. You know, I don't do this often, but I'm, I'm in, in the city, well, close to the city where I lived for 45 years, so I think I have the right to say what I want here. Here's what I think what happens. In a soul, the children behave like a hive, like a beehive. You know, if you've seen a beehive, an individual bee doesn't know how to build a beehive. It has no idea. But a hundred thousand of them together do. They build those perfect hexagons. It's a mechanism that we don't yet understand. Physicists and mathematicians are actually struggling with this idea, but it's a beautiful idea to keep in your mind because I think it will become one of the, the most important subjects in the future. I think what we were seeing at the hole in the wall and subsequently in souls was an example of a self-organizing system. Self-organizing systems exist all over nature, you know, from everywhere. A storm, a cyclone, uh, the monsoon, um, uh, 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 sand dune. They're all examples of self-organizing systems. If you say who made them, the answer is nobody made them. They just happen. I think 
children can show spontaneous order if you leave them alone in the presence of the internet. Leave them alone meaning leave them in groups around the internet, not one child and one internet connection. That's not very good. So if you do that, I think what we were seeing is a self-organizing system. So if a self-organizing system can be created inside a classroom, then you have a nearly teacher-independent method of achieving a learning outcome. So how would you do that? Well, I'll talk about it, but I think it's important for, for me to make this point again to try and explain what a self-organizing system is and what spontaneous order means. So I have a very tiny experiment, which I normally do with children, but if you will give me the liberty to do it, it just takes a few seconds. May I ask you to do the experiment? Okay? It's very simple. What you have to do is, can you clap synchronously all together? Go ahead. Thank you. That's all. If you record that and play it back, you'll hear the first few milliseconds of chaos where everybody's clapping as they feel like. And then the claps come together. Now, if I were to ask you a question, who, who brought the claps together? Well, I could point to any one of you and say, did you bring the claps together? And you'll say, no, I didn't bring the claps together. I was just clapping. So nobody brought the claps together. Who decided the frequency? Nobody did. Who decided the overall volume? Nobody did. So where did it come from? So could we then say that there is something in this room that is not human? So that is the nature of spontaneous order. It comes from nowhere. And it is one of nature's best kept but most popular secrets. I think you can bring it into the education system. And it solves a whole bunch of problems that we have been struggling to do because we follow a military model where everything has to be done to command. But a beehive is not built to a command. It can't be. So a soul basically consists of a mildly chaotic situation caused by a few internet connections, about a quarter of the number of children, and a big interesting question. So what does the teacher do? The teacher is not sending unidirectional instruction. The teacher is just asking a question. But it has to be a well-designed question. If you practice it, you can do it. it it's, a, it's a simple exercise that uh, teachers often do in England and elsewhere in the staff room. So a teacher would say, I'm planning to teach about, uh, I'm planning to teach trigonometry. So what, what would be a good question? You know, just think of it. I mean, you have a room full of teachers here, so just think of what could be. You know, teachers tend to make very boring questions. I mean, a teacher's idea of an interesting question might be, what is trigonometry and why is it important? Well, let me tell you, that's the most boring question you can ask a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old. What would be a more interesting question would be, how does your phone know where it is? Ask them that and leave them alone with the internet. You'll get a whole semester's worth of trigonometry happening in half an hour or 40 minutes. Okay? So that's what a soul is. The idea of the soul started spreading out. Just like the hole in the wall had spread out of India, the soul spread out of Northeast England. And it went everywhere. Why did it go everywhere? Because it didn't need any policies. A soul is something a teacher can do in a classroom. You don't need anybody's permission to do it. Maybe your principal should be aware of the fact that you're doing a soul. That's all. You should be allowed to use the internet during a soul because the soul doesn't work without the internet. But that's about it. Souls spread out through the world around 2010, 2012. Here's yes, he's my cousin. Here's a few examples. Yes, he's my cousin. Look at that question, it's way above. His name was Paul Cezanne. 
Olympics. His dad was his second name and Paul was his first name. Uh, he was French. He was born in 1839 and he died in 1906. So, so on and so forth. So they're, they're always fun to do and uh, I, mean, I, I would strongly recommend that you try it. It only takes one period to try it. Uh, children begin to answer questions far ahead of their time. Okay, that's another property you'll notice when you do it. So nine-year-olds will answer CBSE questions. If you tell them that this is meant for 17-year-olds, okay, I'm going to give you 20 minutes, you can use the internet, you can work in groups, they'll answer it. What does it mean? I don't know. We'll come to that in a second. There's something that you can use to help children get more interest in the process. If, a, if, a, if there's an admiring adult, which in, in your case, if you're a teacher, you can be that adult. You can sort of say, wow, fantastic, how did you do that, etc. You have to admire them. Don't police them. Don't say, now search properly or something like that. Then they'll stop doing everything. Okay, just leave them alone. Come back when they present, then you say, wow, fantastic, how did you do that? If you don't have such a person, and many of our schools in remote areas, we don't have such a person, you can beam a teacher in. I started this in 2008, I think, and we called it a granny cloud because, you know, that behavior of admiring children is something that grandparents do more often than teachers or parents. Teachers and parents use discipline. Grandparents use admiration as their main um, pedagogic method. Because of Skype, and because of uh, a various a host of technologies like WhatsApp and Messenger and so on, with very low bandwidth, it's possible to send a person from one point to another. They shouldn't teach. It's terrible if you have a person on a screen teaching. But they can raise the interesting questions. And they can say, OK, I'll connect back in 20 minutes. You tell me what you found. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. Well done, very good. Yeah. So that was happening between 5,000 miles between Hyderabad and Newcastle. So uh, back in 2013, when I got this prize, I used that money to do an experiment, an experiment called the school in the cloud. The idea was to take two concepts, take the concept of the self-organized learning environment and take the concept of the granny cloud and put them both together and then see what happens. I constructed uh, 10 of them, uh, five in India, um, uh, three in, uh, in the UK, uh, sorry, six in India, two in the UK and two in the United States. Here are some pictures of what those places look like. As you can make out, this is a, a space created inside a school. Okay, you just need one room and you can create this space. Just a few computers with big screens. As you can make out from the picture, it's not meant for lectures. It's meant for children to explore. More pictures. So you get the idea that it's just very simple. This is the remotest one that we have. This is a solar powered unit in a village called Korakati in the Sundarbans. They have nothing there. There's no electricity, there's no uh, health care, uh, there's no schooling to speak of, nothing. And uh, we, we created uh, one of these facilities there. It's currently one of our best. It competes, I think, at many levels with the ones that I have in England and the United States. Uh, the children of Kuragati. So um, let me let me go further. So what is a what is a, a soul? A soul is basically converting a taught lesson into a questioned exploration. There's a school here. This is a picture from Goa in India a school which uh, has at its center the soul. It has regular classrooms, it has the regular school structures, everything. It's affiliated to the Cambridge board, I think. 
but at its core is the soul. So every time a teacher goes into a new topic, she starts with the soul and then goes on. So that when you go to teach, you don't start by saying, today I'm going to teach you about volcanoes. You say, this is what you found out about volcanoes yesterday. Now I'll expand on it a bit because there are two things that you missed out or something like that. It becomes a collaborative activity. So what do these schools in the cloud do? Well, the three-year experiment is over and we have the data from these uh, experiments. It's uh, uh, pretty clear what happens. There is a rapid improvement in reading comprehension. Okay, bound to happen. Because if the children are reading constantly off the screen, the internet doesn't know that they're children. The children don't know that they're not supposed to read uh, that level of English. So they start, they, they keep trying to read and their overall reading comprehension goes up. There's an improvement in communication skills. And of course, there's an improvement in internet searching skills, which I think is extremely important. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that being able to search properly on the internet is a life skill in the 21st century? Then why is it not taught? Because it can't be taught. It can be learned, but it cannot be taught. So that's as far as the good news goes. So, you know, we were told this morning that, you know, focus on the good news. So I've focused on the good news. Groups of children can learn stuff on their own using the internet. Uh, you can make the system a lot less teacher dependent. You can get rapid gains, etc., 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 etc. Here's the bad news. At the end of it all is the exam. So what does the exam do? It's the opposite of the soul. You are alone, you cannot talk to anybody, you cannot use any assistive technology, and you have to answer a question. If you are able to answer those questions, your life will be different. If you're not, well, go to hell. So where did that come from? Why do we have a system like that in the first place? Well, I looked for it, and it's very easy to find, actually. Here. This is a picture from 1920. It's an office in 1920. No assistive technology, no typewriters, almost no typewriters. Uh, data is captured by hand, handwritten, transferred by hand from ledger to ledger, sent by ships from one point to another, 1920. What kind of people do you need to run an office like that? Clerks. People who can sit on the same spot for eight hours a day, not look left, not look right, not talk to each other. They should have good, clear handwriting. They should be able to read and understand instructions. And two things they must never do. They must not question an instruction. And under no circumstances should they be creative. A creative clerk is a dangerous thing. Wouldn't you agree? So, how did they produce in 1920 millions and millions of such people to run such offices? Well, they created an engine. That engine is called school. So, I, I know I'm, this is the wrong audience to say this to, but you, are, you work in schools, you are head of, heads of schools. Think to yourself, are you running a clerk-making factory for 1920, or are you not? Just ask yourself, just in case. So in order to cater to this obsolete examination system, we, the teachers, have no option but to follow the obsolete methods of the 19th century. Drill and practice, discipline, negative reinforcement, rote learning, etc. So it's not as though teachers are evil people doing all this. We don't have a choice. You have to prepare them for that exam. And that exam is from the 19th century. It's like a time machine. Whereas, this is the world that you have to prepare your children for, isn't it? That's what the average office looks like these days. Doesn't it remind you of the hole in the wall? People huddled around the internet. That's the office that environment we are in. So if you have to prepare your children for that uh, kind of an office, 
and that kind of a lifestyle, shouldn't the examination system look like this? So I'm making just one administrative suggestion, the only one administrative suggestion I have. Use of the internet should be allowed during exams. I know it sounds ghastly. In England, when I once first said that a couple of years ago, one of the teachers said, but they'll answer everything. <laughs> so, so I said, don't you want them to? You know. There's another reason I'm saying this. Last year I read a newspaper report when I was uh, here the last time. It was an absurd report, a really funny report. It said, army deployed for CBSE exams. So I said, whatever for? You know what the army was deployed for? The 300 million children giving that exam, the army was to search for mobile phones, just in case they're smuggling in a mobile phone. So then I thought, well, what are they going to do next year? No mobile phones, no smart watches. The year after that, no mobile phones, no smart watches, no Bluetooth headphones, no jewelry, because jewelry might be smart. The year after that, no clothes. <laughs> the year after that, every child must go through an MRI scanner. <laughs> it's absurd. So I'm, I'm saying it's not a question of whether we want to introduce the internet into the examination. It's a question of can we ever stop it? So if you know that it's inevitable that the children are going to access the internet all the time, why don't we let them from now? Here in this country, I come from West Bengal, the, the quick answer is we have so many million poor children who do not have access to the internet. And I will counter by saying, therefore, the ones who cannot access the internet should not. Does that make any sense? Well, I know it sounds cruel, but are we going to be a country where the children who can run will not be allowed to because others can't? That doesn't make sense either. You think about it. So I, uh, I know I'm over time, <laughs> just, just one minute I'm finishing. Um, I, I'm suggesting that we, we, we change reading, writing, and arithmetic as the, as the pillars of education, we change it to three other things, broader areas, comprehension, communication, and computing. You subsume reading, writing, and arithmetic inside that. And I know it's going to be a hard decision, both for yourselves, for the government, for everybody, but take, take a close look at the curriculum. How important is writing by hand? The children that you teach, when they are eventually 30 years later in their jobs, how important is writing by hand going to be? When was the last time you wrote one full A4 sized thing by hand? And when will your children ever write that? There will be many things in the curriculum which are like that. We need to sit down and take them out, no matter how painful it might seem. I think schools should enable people to live happy, healthy, and productive lives. I don't think anybody will argue against that. So I'm suggesting you make a matrix like this. Put happy, healthy, productive on one side, put comprehension, communication, computing on the other side, and see if what you're doing fits into that matrix or not. Just one example and I'll stop. Take dancing. Does it make you happy? Yes, of course it does. Does it make you healthy? Yes, it does. Does it make you productive? Yes, it teaches you a new form of communication, body language, rhythm. It checks all the boxes. It should be there in school. Take the 17 times tables, which I think you still teach, or children have to learn. Does it make you happy? I don't think so. Does it make you healthy? No, certainly not. Does it make you productive? Yes, it did in 1920. You decide if you want to keep it there or not. So I'm working right now on three things. What changes should we make to curriculum? Should it be full of facts? Or should we find the big questions to which the internet also doesn't have the answers? 
because then you don't care if the internet comes into the exam hall or not. A pedagogy that allows the use of the internet in every aspect of schooling. The internet dominates our lives 24 by 7. Every one of you has the internet in your pocket right now. Why should the children not live in that world? And finally, an assessment system that looks for productivity over method. You want the child to be able to answer, to give the correct answer in a short period of time. You don't care how any longer. We need to change the assessment system to reflect that. Anyway, there are two websites. There's a School in the Cloud uh, website, and uh, there is a Granny Cloud website, very easy to find if you Google. And somewhere in the middle of all this, self-organized learning, spontaneous order, the change in the assessment system, I think somewhere there lies the future of learning. Thank you very much. Thank you.